It's, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Piotr Sukowski from the University of Warsaw as our last speaker of our workshop. And he's going to talk to us about knots, quivers, and BPS states. Please go ahead, Piotr. Thank you very much for the invitation. So this is indeed the title, and this is somehow what I understood I was asked to talk about. Uh, that's why I, I present this topic. This is based on some, let's say, research program we have been conducting for a few years. And it relates, well, as you see in the title and in the picture knots uh, and quivers. And it also, as usual in our field, it is also related to many other uh, developments, Gromov-Witten theory, 3D and equal to supersymmetric theories, some statistical models of uh, counting of lattice paths, uh, and so on. In particular, also a, a novel kind of incarnation of, uh, of these quivers in relation to knots appears in the context of FK invariants that Sergey Bukov was talking about several hours ago. Unfortunately, I could not quite attend the talk because of the time difference. Uh, but I hope that uh, whatever I say might be in a way treated as uh, some introduction in a sense to his talk. I mean, I'm sure it was self-contained, but uh, in particular, we had a couple of papers uh, within the last year. We, and in the last paper, we found a novel uh, way how the quivers appear also in relation to knots. So this is in some way of continuation of this work, so I will summarize now. And uh, the first papers where we found this relation between knots and quivers are the papers from 2017, uh, these two. So if you like to have a, a slower start, you can just look carefully at, uh, at these two papers. Yeah, and in this talk, I will just try to summarize what has happened since, uh, since that time. And I will start with a very well-known picture you must be aware of, namely of the so-called geometric transition, which uh, is a process where you replace resolved conivolt by deformed conifold or vice versa by resolving uh, the conifold singularity into different ways. So I'm sure all of you or most of you are familiar with that picture. And what is uh, important for us is that this uh, conifold transition makes contact with not invariants by the relation to turn simons theory, which then, as you also know, computes invariants of knots uh, as expectation values of Wilson loops. So the point is that if you consider the deformed conifold, which is uh, schematically shown in the, in the left picture uh, in this slide, then it is, has a base S3. This deformed conifold is the cotangent bundle of S3. And then if you considered a model topological strings on this deformed uh, conifold, then uh, essentially its amplitudes reduce to amplitudes in turn Simon's theory on S3. This was noted by Witten in 1993. So if you want to compute some amplitudes in this uh, topological string theory, you can essentially restrict to turn Simon's theory. Uh, but the important point is that you can resolve this uh, conifold singularity in another way by replacing this singularity by S2 then you get so-called resolved conifold. Uh, and uh, in this case, the size of this S2 is related to the number of brains which uh, in this deformed conifold were wrapped on S3. I should have mentioned that before. To engineer turn simons theory, let's say as you enter in Simons, in this picture on the left-hand side, you have to wrap N topological brains on this S3. And then this number, that reminds the size of uh, S2 on the right-hand side. In this process, these brains are supposed to vanish. And on the right-hand side, we get the framework relevant for Gromov-Witten theory. This is an example also of open-closed uh, transition. So on the right-hand side, it is natural to compute uh, just in this setup closed Gromov-Witten invariants. And it turns out that they can be related to Chern-Simons amplitudes. <clears throat> 
And uh, these gramophytanine variants give the series in uh, topological string coupling, GS, or sometimes it is known with H bar. And by resummation, which you have to do during this transition, this is related to amplitude in turn Simon's theory, which are usually expressed in Q, which is the exponent of GS. So this is also important that this dependence on Q or on GS appears in different uh, in different way on both sides. Uh, and well, this is more or less a standard story. Uh, in fact, I have not mentioned knots yet, but there is uh, also a nice way to introduce knots in this picture. Namely, you have to introduce an extra Lagrangian brain on the left-hand side. It is engineered in such a way that it intersects the space as free along a knot you are interested in. And then it turns out that, again, topological string amplitudes with the presence of such an extra brain in this case, compute not invariance for a knot which was engineered by this intersection. And also this brain somehow persists during this transition, if this is included. It appears also on the right-hand side, and then one can compute open gram of written invariance and to formulate not invariance in that set. So, these stories are known for well around 20 or 25 years. In particular, this in, uh, insertion of extra brains was considered by Oguri and Waffa. And uh, moreover, what they realized is that you can embed this picture to the full superstring theory by including extra space-time directions, which I denote here by M4. This M4 can be simply R4 or something uh, or also not too complicated. And in this case, these Lagrangian brains I mentioned, namely those which wrap on S3 or these extra brains which define a node, are interpreted as parts of M5 brains, if, if you want to consider M3 or, or a part of uh, the four brains, if you just restrict the type to A. And apart from these three internal directions in this conical geometry, they also span two dimensions in this extra space-time directions. And this, uh, this picture also persists after geometric transition. If you make the, this transition, we get resolved conifold, then we don't have this N5 brains. We have resolved conifold with this extra Lagrangian brain. And well, I don't want to go too much details. Uh, in some way, this is uh, well known, but the bottom line is that then different amplitudes which appear in the systems can be expressed in terms of BPS invariants. So this is in particular what uh, Oguri and Waffa did in the context of knots in the presence of this extra brain. And then they postulated, later on there were also follow-up follow -up works with Labastida and Marino, they postulated that various knot polynomials can be represented in terms of certain integral numbers. And these integral numbers provide a reformulation of this, uh, of this knot invariant. So let me show you in a bit more detail just how this reformulation looks like. In the first line or in this first frame in the slide, on the left hand side, you have something that I called P with uh, subscript R depending on AQ. So these are supposed to be Humphrey polynomials for a given node, which I am considering. If you are not that much familiar with knot invariants, let me just say that Humphrey polynomials are some polynomials in two variables A and Q which are not invariant. So if you have uh, a knot, if you project it on a plane, then you see some diagram with some crossings. Then if you manipulate this diagram, but without cutting, uh, but possibly changing the configuration of crossings, then uh, the polynomial, this complete polynomial that you compute uh, does not change. This is the statement of topological invariance. And uh, you can effectively compute it if you know this pattern of crossings by, for example, using so-called Skine relations. 
So not theorists and not Angler are interested in, in these uh, polynomials. And in fact, these polynomials arise in families. More generally, you have so-called colored country polynomials. And uh, these families are labeled by Young diagrams. So this R, capital R, is supposed to denote uh, Young diagrams, and the sum is over all Young diagrams. And then you can consider the generating function which, uh, which uh, is given here. So you sum over all the Young diagrams R, or you think of them as uh, representations, with some generating parameters represented here by uh, trace uh, in this representation R over some matrices V. You can think of them as just keeping track of, of that sum and being generating parameters. And then the statement of Ogure and Waffa is that such a sum you can express as on the right hand side. So this thing on the right hand side has some particular structure whose details are encoded in this functions f, small f, whose structure is given in the second frame. And you see that this, well, they also have some universal structure which depends on certain integer which I denote by capital N with some subscripts. So these capital N's are essentially these BPS invariants that I mentioned. They count certain BPS particles in this effective theory uh, in the space-time part of this setup I, I had in the previous slide. So this is quite an untrivial statement. And after that uh, original discovery, people spent some time trying to show that this is indeed true. And the main activity at that time was just consider examples and show it uh, for more and more representations and for more and more complicated dots. But uh, general proof seems to, uh, to be missing at, at that time. Uh, just to appreciate how non-trivial it is or what the statement means, you can expand like the expression in the first line in uh, powers of entries of V and then manipulate somehow in such a way that uh, ultimately you can express these functions F in terms of these uh, comfy, colored comfy polynomials. And for example, F labeled by the, the third symmetric representation is given by the formula we see here. So you see that this formula, first of all, has some non-trivial denominators. It also has certain fractions like this uh, one third. But nonetheless, if you make this summation, you are expected to get something which has structure as in the second line, so something that has just a very simple denominator and uh, coefficients are just integers. So uh, this is somehow in trivial. And uh, in fact, you can simplify a bit uh, these considerations if you consider this matrix V I had in the first line to be just of size one by one. So let's replace it by X. Then uh, these sums reduce to sums over symmetric representations. So essentially the Young diagrams, which consists just of one row of arbitrary length. And there's this expression in the first line you can write in a product form. Maybe this is a bit more. Uh, more intuitive what it means. Uh, in this case, this is just some uh, uh, product of quantum bilogarithms. Uh, this is given in this uh, bottom expression in this slide. So uh, if you fix R, it is uh, variables uh, I multiply over. If you fix R, I, and J, then the product over K is uh, so-called quantum bilogarithm. And then these BPS numbers arise in, uh, in the exponent. So uh, essentially the problem which arose at that time was to prove uh, that these exponents are indeed integers if you start from uh, like not theory data and also to understand their properties. In general, there is uh, an infinite number of these integers for, for a uh, for a given uh, not, uh, let's say. So the question is also what is the nature of these integers and whether they have some possibly simpler structure. And uh, essentially the answer to these questions, uh, at least in the setup where we consider the symmetric representations, arises from this non-squiver correspondence that, that we have. So this is why I uh, 
we gave this intro, a short introduction. And the statement of this correspondence is that uh, you can encode the structure of these BPS states, which, uh, which I just mentioned. You can encode their structure. Uh, and uh, in fact, there is a certain number of elementary, so-called elementary BPS states, which correspond to the nodes of such a, of, of, uh, of a given quiver. And then all these BPS states uh, that arise from this auguri vefa formula are bound states of these elementary states. Uh, so just to have some uh, example uh, in this picture here, you have a trefoil knot, uh, the simplest non-trivial knot. And then we find that the corresponding quiver is the one which you see on the right hand side. It consists of three nodes and there is a number of arrows which means that uh, in this uh, like string theory system, which we engineer, or in this effective space-time description, there are three basic BPS states, which can form bound states. The, the way how these bound states are formed is somehow governed by the arrows in that quiver. And this gives rise to all these uh, invariants that are encoded in auguri Vafa formula. And to be more precise, uh, the main object from, uh, from this quiver side I will be interested in is so-called quiver generating function. So from mathematical viewpoint, uh, when I have such a quiver, well, it must have been recalled several times uh, in this meeting, then we are interested in moduli space of maps between the vector spaces associated to different vertices. And uh, these moduli spaces are characterized in particular by so-called motivic donaldson thomas invariants, which tells us something about dimensions of homologies of, uh, of these spaces. And there is an effective way to determine such motivic donaldson thomas invariants. Namely, one has to consider the generating function, which is given in the first line uh, in this expression I, I just showed. So this generating function is a certain summation over all possible dimension vectors. By dimension vector, I mean a vector whose entries are dimensions of vector spaces associated to the different nodes of a quiver. So if I have M nodes, I sum over uh, M non-negative integers, which I denote uh, D1, D2 up to Dn. And then you see this generating function has some also uh, kind of simple structure in fact. So in numerator, I have Q to the power, which is just quadratic expression in those Ds and the coefficients in this quadratic expressions denoted by Cij. These coefficients are just the numbers of arrows. So C, C is a matrix uh, adjacent to the matrix of, uh, of the quiver I am considering. Cij is the number of arrows between node i and node j in the quiver. And the whole information about the quiver is encoded, I mean, the whole information of the quiver in this expression is just encoded in this coefficient uh, in this quadratic exponent. And then in the denominator, I have uh, a bunch of q for hammers with uh, subscripts d1 up to dm. So for each di, I, I have one q for hammer. And then I have some extra generating parameters, which I denote x1 up to, up to xm, which are raised to powers, just linear powers, d1 up to dm. So there is a statement in quiver representation theory that such a generating function has a product decomposition given in the second line. You can also think of this decomposition as decomposition into quantum dilogarithms, namely the product over k in the second line gives us the structure of quantum dilogarithm. For a fixed uh, dimension vector on fixed J. And then you see this motivic donaldson thomas invariants appear as exponents in that expression. So for mathematicians, this is a way to find this motivic donaldson thomas invariants and get to know something about moduli spaces of this, of these maps. <clears throat> 
And uh, now you can see that the structure of this product in the second line is uh, analogous to the structure of the Soguri Vafa formula that I had before. So in both cases, we have uh, a bunch of quantum by logarithms, and we have exponents which, uh, well, in Oguri Vafa story, I denoted by n, and they represent these BPS particles. In this quiver setup, these are motivic Donaldson and Thomas invariants. So we realized that uh, if you adjust various variables uh, in a relevant way, in particular, if you adjust the form of this xi generating parameters from the quiver side, then these two expressions, you, you can identify this type of product expressions, and then you can engineer back this uh, quiver generating function, and you can reconstruct the quiver behind the problem uh, you are considering. Uh, and well, this identification of parameters is shown here, now in the bottom. So the statement is, well, without going into too much details because uh, the time I have is also restricted, but uh, just the bottom line is that if you identify xi in the following way, as you see here, so you have a single parameter x, which is identified as the generating parameter for colored Humphrey polynomials just for the symmetrically color. So on the left-hand side uh, of the first line, uh, I consider again a generating function of colored Humphrey polynomials. Now the subscript is a, just a single R and this X to power R is something that remains from this trace of V I had before in some representation R when I consider V to be one dimensional and being represented just by X, then this summation reduces just to the sum over symmetrically colored uh, complete polynomials. Then the statement is that I can write it in uh, this form of quiver generating function on the right hand side, where dependence on A and Q follows from this identification of different xi's. So as I mentioned, each xi involves single x, but it also involves a and q raised to some powers, which are also simply determined by, by a given knot. Let me not go into details, but uh, one can kind of uh, easily find what this ai and li's are. You can think of them as some constants associated to, to, to a given knot. And this gives dependence on uh, A and Q. So uh, this is one consequence uh, of this the relation between knots and quivers. The, the generating functions of colored Humphrey polynomials can be encoded in a data determined by, by a given quiver. And uh, already once a kind of surprising consequence of this statement is that infinite number of colored Humphrey polynomials or this uh, LMOV invariants is encoded in a finite number of parameters of a matrix C. So I think it was not cool, uh, known before, namely the data which we need for the right hand side is just the matrix C and well also a number of these parameters AI Li and Ti, I mentioned, but this is a finite number of parameters. If we fix this finite number of parameters, by this equation, we can read off infinite number of uh, colored uh, complete polynomials. So this is one interesting consequence of this relation. And there are also other ones. So you can now match different quantities which correspond either to quivers or to knots and relate them to each other. For example, if you have a quiver, then uh, the quivers I consider may also have loops. By loops, I mean arrows which start at one vertex and go back to the same vertex. So for example, the number of loops is related to so-called framing of not invariants, and also homological degrees. I'll try to say a few words what these homological degrees are maybe in a few minutes, but now let me just let me just make such a statement that there is relation, I mean, this number of loops has relation to these objects on the not theory side. 
I already mentioned that colored Humphrey polynomials are related to this. I mean, uh, if you consider generating function of colored Humphrey polynomials, then it has the structure of this motivating generating series. And then it follows that these BPS invariants are so called LMOV invariants. Uh, the acronyms stand, of course, for Labastida, Marini, and Murray, and Buffa. They are related to motivic Donaldson Thomas invariants by this identification. And now also comes the crucial point, which is that this motivic DT invariants are proven to be integer and uh, even positive integer if you take some signs carefully into account. There are mathematical proofs of, of that. So by this relation, we get the proof that these LMOV invariants are also integers, which, uh, which was the puzzle since uh, Algorin Bafa postulated uh, this relation. So this is also quite satisfying point of, uh, of that relation. And uh, this also holds for so-called numerical DT invariants. They get related to so-called classical LMOV invariants. These are invariants which uh, appear uh, in some uh, appropriately defined classical limit of, the, of all these expressions. Uh, from this viewpoint, it sounds uh, obvious that uh, you should have also this uh, integrality structure for classical invariants. But even uh, this statement previously was not uh, not known or not quite understood. And then <clears throat> there are various objects on, uh, on uh, both sides, various other objects which you can also relate to each other. For example, the algebra of BPS states, which you can consider from this not theory viewpoint, uh, is naturally represented by cohomology whole algebra. And there are other objects. Well, I don't have too much time and too much space here, so I don't. Uh, I will finish this table just here, but uh, I hope this is somehow convincing that this relation is not just between the generating function I just showed, but there are more interesting structure like this moduli spaces, uh, this whole algebras and so on, which can be matched on, uh, on both sides. Uh, and uh, just to say a word what these homological invariants are, uh, because they also appear in a way somehow magically in this quiver. I will show you in a moment how. But let me uh, say that this Humphrey polynomials that I mentioned, which I denoted by P with arguments A and Q, they can be thought of as Euler characteristics of more general uh, spaces, so called not homologies as shown in the first line here. So this is a development which started with the work of Kovanov, who realized that, uh, in fact, in his case, he considered Jones polynomial that coefficients of this Jones polynomial are integer. And he explained that uh, this is not accidental that these are integers. They are integers because they arise as dimensions of some spaces, uh, appropriately constructed homologies that he yeah, found uh, first time in the case of, of the Jones polynomials. So in this first line, you see what is general structure of this uh, Jones or in this case Humphrey polynomials. They are polynomials in A and Q and they have some coefficients which are integer. They are integer because they are dimensions of the spaces identified by H. In case of Humphrey polynomials, you may have negative signs because there is this minus one to power k. And because of this minus sign, you may also lose some information because some cancellations appear in the expressions that, that you consider. But to get some insight into these homological spaces, it is quite natural to consider Poincare characteristic instead of Euler characteristic. So you can replace minus one by some new variable t. And then you get so-called super polynomials, as shown in the second line, which are still polynomials, but now in three variables, a, q, and t, they have necessarily positive coefficients. Because these coefficients are uh, positive. Yes? Uh, there, there was a, a, a short a gap 
in audio transmission, so we didn't hear you. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so I'm not what you lost. Uh, but the bottom line is that there is a natural or kind of uh, straightforward generalization of this country polynomials to so so-called super polynomials which depend, which depend on extra parameters. And in case of uh, uncolored polynomials, which means those which correspond to symmetric representation or just the original complete polynomials, uh, it is quite common to represent the structure of this super polynomial on a diagram as shown here. Namely, you look at all coefficients, I mean, all monomials in, in the sum colored polynomial. So here I have the example for figure eight naught. On the right hand side, you have explicitly the form of this sum colored super polynomial. And then each term in the super polynomial is denoted by a dot in this diagram. The powers of A and Q are correspond to the location on horizontal or vertical axis. And the power of T is extra parameter, which can also be. I haven't shown it in the diagram, but this is also assigned to, to each dot in this diagram. So I am telling about this to show you one other surprising uh, feature of this relation to quivers, which was not built in, but it somehow magically arises. Namely, it turns out that those powers of T arise as diagonal elements of the quiver. And I hope uh, I convince you that these powers of T know something about homological uh, structure of not invariants, which is much more general than the structure of just Comte polynomials. It was not built in our picture, but we just find that in these quivers, the diagonal elements, which also correspond to the number of loops, uh, and code this homological information. I sh should also stress that diagonal elements in the quiver matrix, I told you that Cij element of the quiver matrix tells us how many arrows you have between vertex i and vertex j. So in particular, diagonal ele elements, Cii, are the number of arrows from vertex i to itself, uh, so the number of loops. So this is why this number of loops tells us about these homological degrees. And well, uh, let me just show you some examples. It may be more, uh, more intuitive to see how it works in practice, first of all. And second, it is also good to see that it indeed works and you can do some real work or uh, I mean explicit work in computations and not just uh, abstract uh, considerations and abstract proofs. So it is known that uh, for, for some nodes we know explicit expressions for colored polynomials. Here is one for trefoil knot. If you manipulate with this expression and manipulate with the skew hammers, then you can put this, I mean, you can consider generating functions of these polynomials, and then you can put it into the form of this quiver generating series. And from that form, you read off the corresponding quiver. So I wrote the quiver matrix here, and this matrix and comes the quiver, which is shown in the picture, which is, of course, the quiver I, I showed you before. And then we can make something similar for other nodes, for example, for 2,5 torus nodes. Uh, torus knot, uh, we find a bit more complicated quiver matrix. This is of size 5, which means that we would have five nodes in this case, and so on. For other torus nodes, we find, for example, the following matrices. So you see that all the centers here are integer and they encode the structure of these BPS invariants, which are also integers. And the fact that we can find these matrices, this is quite, quite non-trivial. They have already quite large sizes, even, even for this relatively simple knots. This is the squiver matrix for 6-2 knot. It is of size 11. This is for, si for knot 6-3. This is for size 13. And yeah, I can also assure that this is quite non-trivial to predict from uh, like without all this knowledge about quivers that all these concrete polynomials would be encoded in uh, some matrices with such uh, such particular structure. So what is the meaning of the negative entries that you have in these matrices? What, how do I interpret that? 
Well, uh, you maybe cannot immediately interpret uh, the negative entries as the number of loops. I mean, in a sense, you would have, sorry, not number of loops, but uh, number of uh, arrows. But uh, I mean, you can formally reconstruct this, uh, construct this quiver. And then in not theory, which uh, you have the operation of framing, which is a very simple operation uh, on and off. And it deforms, I mean, it changes not invariance in a very simple way. And on the quiver side, this framing operation corresponds to increasing each entry of a quiver matrix by one. So what I can do is I can make this framing some number of times in such a way that all entries in this matrix become positive. So at least this is a way to maybe think of, uh, of what that should mean. If you want to have, uh, let's say, just positive entries and well-defined uh, quiver corresponding to a given node, then I can consider a framed knot, and then I can always get a quiver with positive entries. So you may ask, of course, uh, how well this correspondence is understood. And in fact, this is understood quite well. I mean, we have many examples for which we can find the corresponding quiver. So first of all, just by considering examples, it was found for all nodes up to six crossings. And also for some particular infinite families of nodes, such as two, two comma, I mean two comma two p plus one torus nodes or uh, so-called twist nodes. And later on, it was proven that the quivers exist for rational nodes. Rational nodes is a big family of nodes which correspond to rational numbers between zero and one. This was proven by Stosis and Vedrish, and then they even have a very explicit algorithm which tells you how to find the corresponding quiver. And then they proved that the quiver exists even for a larger family of so-called arborescent nodes. So, I mean, there is, I admit, there is no mathematical proof that such a quiver should exist for all nodes, but it is proven for quite large infinite families of nodes that it exists. And of course, from this physics viewpoint and this considerations I presented in the beginning, it is uh, kind of natural that such quivers should, should exist if we embed everything in the string theory setup and think of this corresponding BPS invariance. Okay, so what I have presented so far is a review of this original correspondence and I, then I hope I would have some time to present some more uh, I mean, more recent developments, but probably I do, I do not have that much time for that. Uh, well, I have some slides. Let me just go through them very quickly. And let me tell you, the first thing is uh, the statement that the quivers which correspond to nodes are not, in fact, are not unique. And for a given node, you can find uh, several quivers or sometimes quite many quivers, which encode the same not invariants. And these quivers are related uh, in a way, in, in somehow, in some simple way, but it is important to understand why these quivers arise. And also if you consider the relation to supersymmetric 3D and equal to supersymmetric theories by 3D, 3D correspondence, then this gives us a, also new families of dualities between 3D and equal to theories. So here are the numbers of this equivalent quivers uh, in the right-hand side in this table. So to var for various nodes like torus nodes or twist nodes uh, and some other ones, there are in fact quite large number of these equivalent quivers. And uh, it is useful to present these quivers, this equivalence relations in some pictures, which turns out to have the structure of permutohedra. So without going into technical details, let me just show you some examples. Uh, for example, like this one, this is, uh, well, let me, yeah, this is the example for nine one node. So this is a diagram. Each node in this diagram 
corresponds to a different quiver. And uh, I mean, each dot uh, represents a quiver which encodes the same not invariance for, for, for this node. And you see that these different quivers are not just random ones, but there is some structure, namely they arise in families of so-called per permutahedra. So let me go back. A permutahedron is uh, some uh, possibly higher dimensional polytope whose vertices represent permutations of n objects, if we have n minus one dimensional polytope, and edges correspond to transpositions of adjacent neighbors. This is even simpler examples if you have just, uh, if you have three objects, then there are six possible permutations, which we can represent uh, by hexagon. And for higher dimensional or larger number of objects, we have higher dimensional structures of permutahedra. And then these uh, graphs, which I just showed you, arise from gluing permutahedra of different dimensions. So for 9, 1, you see that you have this two permutahedra. These are like this three dimensional kind of, uh, not balls, but these three dimensional structures. And then there are these two hexagons glued on the uh, right and left hand side, and also some individual segments, which corresponds to uh, permutations of just two elements. So let me just tell you that there is some intricate structure of this equivalent quivers, and this gives rise to also nice pictures for various nodes. So this is 9-1 again, this is 11-1, the higher dimensional permutahedra arise, and so on. For 6-1, we have such a structure, so uh, we had a paper last year where we analyzed this equivalence. I don't have time to go into details, but I hope that these pictures are nice. So this is one message. And the last message I have is that instead of considering more complicated nodes, which means more complicated Lagrangian brains, you can consider more complicated underlying Calabi-Yau manifold. So instead of considering, considering resolved conifold, in this string theory setup, we can consider so-called generalized conifolds or certain toric manifolds, which can be encoded in planar diagrams, like in this picture. And there is a nice family of such diagrams which do not have loops, which means they correspond to manifolds which don't have compact for cycles. So we can consider such a family of Calabi-Yau manifolds with a simple aganagich wafa brain, which are in original resolved conifold would correspond to the unknot. In this case, it is not quite the unknot, but this is certain brain in the uh, for the historic manifolds. And then everything I said before somehow uh, goes through again. Namely, we can show that brain partition functions in this case also have the structure of quiver generating functions. We can find corresponding quivers and then we can prove integrality of BPS invariants which appear in this system. Like the string theory interpretation is analogous to what, what I had before. So I don't have time to present this in more detail, but let me just tell you that uh, apart from resolved conifold, this picture and corresponding quivers arise also for other Calabiago manifolds. In particular, we can determine explicitly some BPS numbers. So one such formula is shown here in the bottom of this slide. Now it looks complicated, but it is quite non-trivial that this is a an integer as follows from all these BPS interpretations. This is something that attracted attention also of some number of theorists. And in particular, there is some paper where it is proven that such type of expressions are indeed integers using some like number theory methods. So let me summarize. Uh, I hope I presented at least briefly what is not Squiver's correspondence is. I tried to present its uh, string theory interpretation and some motivation why it should arise. I didn't discuss that much these other uh, manifestations of that and the role it plays for 3D and equal to supersymmetric gauge theories. I mean, these BPS states that arise, uh, arise in these theories, but I didn't say too much about it. Uh, and also, I didn't say that much about this counting of lattice paths, uh, well, permutahedra, there is some relation to topology quadro and so on. I hope that Sergey Lukov told you something about relation to FK 
invariance and then also analogous quivers appear. So I hope that there is still much to be done and I encourage everyone to work on uh, these topics. I'd be happy to discuss more, of course. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk, Piotr.